Did you know that Paul Limecooler designed the first pair of ski outriggers in the U.S. which launched the adaptive ski movement? We'll discuss this and other interesting facts about the documentary Fresh Tracks with executive film producer Katie Limecooler on this episode of The Curious Professor. everyone, I'm Dr. B. Welcome to the Curious Professor podcast, where I take listeners on a journey of discovery to explore the people, places, artifacts, and natural wonders that spark my curiosity. On this episode of the Curious Professor podcast, we'll explore the incredible true story of Paul Limecooler, a pioneer of the adaptive ski movement with his granddaughter, Katie Limecooler. But first, a trivia question. What's the difference between orthotics and prosthetics? I'll have the answer for you at the end of this episode. I'm thrilled to have Katie Limecooler on the show today. Katie is the executive producer of the documentary Fresh Tracks and the granddaughter of Paul Limecooler, who inspired the film. Her goal is to share his powerful story with the world. Katie is an expert brand storyteller and executive coach at her business, Limecooler Media. She has a background in writing and marketing and has been a contributing writer to several publications, including Social Media Examiner, Business to Community, Startup Grind, Social Media Today, The Sun Times, Built in Colorado, and Technori. She is a board member of Cleveland Together in Digital and was awarded the Northeast Ohio Movers and Shakers Top 25 Under 35 Award in 2019. When I found out about Katie's inspirational documentary, my curiosity was immediately piqued and I wanted to learn more. I hope this interview with Katie will spark your curiosity too. Welcome to the show, Katie. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Your grandfather, Paul Limecooler, was a pioneer of amputee skiing. What did you admire most about him? I admired his determination. You know, he always found a way to persevere through everything he went through in his life, whether that was, you know, World War II and coming out of the Battle of the Bulge or starting a business. Um, He was just a very determined person and always found a way. So I really admired that. Why did you decide to make a documentary about his life story? I originally wrote it as a screenplay because I thought it would be a story so many people could relate to. And once people told me to be really true to his story, I should make a documentary because I would have more creative control over it. And so that's kind of how the project started. And my goal is to help people reimagine their challenges as opportunities. And that's what my grandfather did. And I really wanted to get that message out into the world. And that's what, you know, we hope to do with the film. And how did your grandfather lose his leg? So he was a lieutenant in the Battle of Belgium World War II, and a piece of grenade shrapnel hit his leg. And so they, they watched it for a couple of days. And then, you know, he actually asked for it to be amputated. You know, they were deciding whether or not, but it was, it was kind of a lost cause at that point. So yeah, so they amputated his leg and then he came back to the U.S. and started recovering as an amputee. It was interesting that your grandfather created his own prosthetic leg. Can you tell us a little bit more about that story? Yeah, so he came back to the hospital in the U.S. and was there for nearly a year because there was such a wait list for artificial legs because there were so many wounded soldiers at that time. So he went down to the limb shop and volunteered to help out, which is definitely unheard of today. You know, you wouldn't be able to do that. But he was prior to that an engineer. And so he said, hey, I'm good with my hands. I'm like, I'm sure I could help out. And so they started training him and he actually made his own leg. So that was his first leg he made was his own. And then he started making rounds with the surgeons with other patients that they were seeing and advising on, you know, this could fit better here. This is, you know, from what I can tell, it would be better this way. So he um, actually started working with the doctors right after that. And I found it fascinating when I was doing research into his story and the story of your family that he created a prosthetic shop that still is in your family today. 
Yeah, it's pretty incredible. So he started his company, I think, in 1948, Land Cooler Limco, and it's evolved um, to many offices. And my brother, my dad, my uncle, and cousins, like all of them are involved. It's everyone in my family, or a lot of people in my family are involved in the business. So it's really been cool to grow up in that kind of field and be around prosthetics and amputees and get a window into the soul of like what his life was like and what amputees today are dealing with. But yeah, I think it's really incredible work that people are doing to help someone walk again and give them a sense of normalcy back. And that field has come a long way from the times when your grandfather lost his leg in World War II to today when it's almost to a point where they have bionic legs. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really changed a lot over the years. And it's gotten so much better. And, you know, athletes are using them in new and different ways. And, you know, I think he would be really excited if he was still around today to see the progress that's been made because it's been quite incredible. Before going to war, your grandfather was a champion cyclist and ice skater. And then after he lost his leg, he decided to become a skier. What motivated him to get into that sport? So he had never skied before. Um, the first time he skied was only on one leg. So my grandma and some other friends went to Seven Springs and he he loved film. And so he's like, I'll be the videographer. I'll film you guys while you ski because obviously I, I'm an amputee, I cannot. And so as he's filming, this Austrian ski instructor told him like, hey, that could be you out there. And he's like, oh, what do you mean? He goes, amputees are skiing in Europe. Check out this film called Miracle on Skis. And so my grandpa went to the Cleveland Public Library and rented it and then started making sketches for the outrigger design, which is a pole with the ski tip on the end that helps you balance as opposed to the regular ski poles. So he made those and then hiked up the, the Cleveland Metro golf course and skied down there for the first time with one of his friends. So after he did it, he was hooked. I actually found that movie your grandfather watched on YouTube and it's available and people can watch it if they're interested in viewing it. It's a little bit dated now, but, but it's still yeah. fascinating to see. What do you think people will find most inspiring about your grandfather's life and work? I think the ability to change your perspective, even in difficult moments. So losing your leg and being the person to ask to take it off. I think that takes a specific type of person to be able to still see the future. You're not holding on to the past. You're embracing the unknown. And just that mindset overall that you can overcome things, even though you may not be able to see it or that there's a silver lining through every challenge. Because he always said, I don't know what my life would be like if I wasn't an amputee his skiing, which he never did before that, became a main component of his life. Our entire family business, we're all involved in that. So it really changed the entire direction of his life and our lives. And if he didn't see that moment as something, as a possibility, do something better and greater, you know, it could have been a very different outcome. So I think the ability to just reimagine your challenges as opportunities and seek something good out of them. It's a challenge for people to be able to reimagine their lives. And almost you could have a definitely a different life, but a better life. Absolutely. My grandfather's favorite saying was that he took advantage of his disadvantage, which was his disadvantage was becoming an amputee and his advantage was turning that into business, learning to ski. So there's always a way. It's just finding your way. You've stated that Fresh Tracks ended up being a movie about more than just your grandfather. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So we interviewed a lot of Paralympic athletes and adaptive skiers that are using his technology today. So most people had no idea like how the outrigger was designed design and, you know, the story of the person that made it. So we wanted to highlight how people have benefited from his design and how that outrigger design and how adaptive skiing has evolved since his day. And it's come a long way. We have Mike Schultz, who's a Paralympic gold medalist in the film, and he was an amputee and he now does prosthetics too. He kind of same, very similar path, like kind of self-taught, made his own need to perform in the Olympics or the Paralympics. So we wanted to highlight the history of it and then where it is present day. Your grandfather died when you were eight years old. What types of research did you do in order to learn more about him and his incredible story for the documentary? So luckily, he and my grandmother really did a great job of documenting their lives. They had probably a stack of letters, almost like two books full from the war that they wrote back and forth to each other. So that was like a great starting point. I couldn't always read his handwriting, but it really gave us an insight into what the war was like and how they communicated in that time and place. We also 
also had footage that he took. So since he was an amateur videographer, he actually had ski footage of himself. I'm sure someone else took and that he had of his skiing days. So we were lucky to get some color footage from that era, which I think is pretty rare. And it's, you know, decent footage of him skiing and just, you know, kind of at the training camps before he went to off to World War II, where he was like training and going to different places. So we have that footage. So that gave us like a snapshot into their lives. And then um, just talking to other people that knew him or knew of him, my family, obviously his children really gave some insights. And then we also had a lot of photos and just, you know, stories and letters that he wrote. He was such an advocate for skiing and he wanted everyone to have access. So that's why he purposely didn't patent the outrigger design because he wanted everyone to enjoy what he enjoyed, which was skiing. And so he wrote a lot about it for like different news publications like the Cleveland Clean Dealer and just, um, you know, different ski publications at that time. So we also had a lot of firsthand accounts of what his experience was. I found it interesting that you stated that you interviewed about 50 filmmakers about their process. What were some of the things that you learned about filmmaking by doing those interviews? Well, the first thing I learned is that there's no straightforward process, <laughs> which I was kind of hoping for because it, it was a new venture for me. I don't have a background in film, so it was like learning a lot at this time. But I would say the main takeaway was it's kind of what you make of it. Some people come in with a storyline and that's what I did. I had a kind of a vision of what I wanted to do. Other people find the story afterwards, so they might film a bunch of things and weave together the storyline in a documentary. There's also the funding and sponsorship component, whether you go that route, whether you raise money first, you know, finding the right team. There was a lot of things to consider more than I probably anticipated. And so it opened my eyes to what all some really great guidance because I didn't know where to start. And it was great to hear from people that had done it before that could have shared those insights of here's like maybe a good step or talk to these people. So at least I had a framework of, okay, this is how other people have done it. And I can take what works for me and implement that. And how did you go about finding the filmmakers to interview? Yeah, so I started with my network, just like people that knew someone that made movies. And then I reached out to a lot of the movies I would watch. So I would watch them on Netflix or Amazon Prime and, you know, try and reach out to the people that made them to understand how they did it. And also LinkedIn. I'm a huge proponent of LinkedIn and I love social media. So I would find people maybe in the area that I was living in or that had done similar themed movies and say, hey, can we chat or what's the process like for that? And then continually asking them for hey, are there three other people you recommend based on our conversation I should talk to? So it kind of just kept expanding from there. And do you plan on making any more documentaries? I think so. I'm thinking about what my next one will be and looking for the right team to work with on that. So yeah, I'm excited. I think there's possibility for other great stories to be told as well. And what about writing a script for a more fictionalized movie? Do you have any plans to do that? Not at the moment, but I wouldn't rule it out. You've stated that your grandfather had an entrepreneurial spirit. How have you used the lessons you've learned from his life and his amazing journey in your own life and business? It's really funny because throughout making this film, I felt his presence or just like I was almost mirroring the process of what he did because, you know, he didn't know anything about skiing. I didn't know anything about making a film. And, you know, you kind of take those steps to learn it. You teach yourself, okay, who should I talk to? Who are the right people I need to find to learn how to do this um, and bring them along? So as I was going through this process, I'm like, oh, it's very similar to him and what he did in this film, which was learning to ski and making a ski device, which he didn't know how to just starting a business without a business degree or background in that and teaching himself. And I've done that in my own life where I've started a business where I coach people on um, leadership and marketing. And I didn't know how to do that either, but I figured if he could do it and in the 1940s, why can't I? So I think he's given me that outlook to just pursue something that you're interested in. And even if you don't know all the pieces, they'll come together. I think that's great advice for everyone out there who's thinking about attempting a project that they're not sure how to go about doing it. So is there a question that you haven't been asked yet that you wish someone would ask? I think the question that I wish people would ask more about is the kind of his mental state of going, of being an amputee in that transition, because I think that is really hard. And maybe most people don't understand the depths of what that takes and how it's such a toll on people. And probably especially at that time, like he was for sure depressed, you know, initially, like he wasn't this guy that just got up and it's like, Hey, all right, we're going to turn this around. Like there was this dark period and it's easy to gloss over those, right? 
right? Like, and focus on just, wow, this amazing person, but he dealt with depression and dealing with adjusting to life. They had a two-story home and they had to get a one-story home and his car, they had to like change up how to drive it. Like his friends kind of jerry rigged something together. So it's like all these little things in your day-to-day that he had to do that I think sometimes we gloss over because it's It's not the big challenge, but really that's probably more of the long-term daily challenge that people deal with. And I appreciate your honesty in sharing that because I think it's important for other people who are facing challenges to realize it's not all rosy and sunny that you do have to overcome those obstacles, the big obstacles coming to terms with whatever life is bringing your way, but also the day-to-day challenges of how you are continuing to deal with those issues. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about you or your work? I would just say, yeah, I'm really passionate about this story. And my mission in life is to make a positive impact. It's like one of those things where you kind of know it at a young age. And I didn't know what that would be. But I know this film is aligned with that. And there's nothing more important than me right now for people to see this and feel like empowered to do something and walk away and say, okay, this guy can do all these things without a direction book. Maybe I can tackle this challenge. So that's what I really hope comes across in this film and what I feel inspired to do every day and hope to inspire others to do. And where can listeners find out more about you or the film? Yeah, so our website is freshtracksfilm.com and we're on Vimeo On Demand and on Amazon Prime. That's awesome. I hope everyone will take an opportunity to check out this fantastic documentary. It was great to have you on the show, Katie. Thank you so much for taking time to be a guest on the Curious Professor podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It was truly a pleasure. And now for the answer to this episode's trivia question. What's the difference between orthotics and prosthetics? Both orthotics and prosthetics assist with movement and general mobility. The primary difference is whether they assist or replace a part of the body. Orthotics provide splints, braces, or special footwear to patients, while prosthetics are designed and created as artificial body parts that match a missing limb as closely as possible. We'll end the show with something punny. What do skiers eat for lunch? Ice burgers. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the Curious Professor podcast. If there's a person, place, artifact, or natural wonder that has sparked your curiosity and you'd like for me to feature it on the show, please let me know. My website is thecuriousprofessorpodcast.com. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to subscribe to the Curious Professor podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you'd like to become part of my community of curiosity seekers, be sure to visit my website, thecuriousprofessorpodcast.com, and join Dr. B's Hive. Until next time, always be learning and be curious with Dr. B.